Hi, welcome to Physionic, where we learn the body from the macro to the micro. If that's something you think you'd be interested in, then consider subscribing. In this exam and content, we're going to be dissecting this particular paper, looking at how honey, sucrose, and the most common form of high fructose corn syrup affect human health but specifically focused on glucose or blood sugar regulation. So if that's what you're here to find out about, then this extremely interesting paper is going to be what we will be dissecting together. So without further ado, let's jump into this examined content. All right, let's jump into the methods. How did they go about this particular study? So there were 55 participants of which most of them were women with ages ranging between 20 and 80 years old. So a rather diverse population. Now of those 55, they broke it up into 27 individuals that were pre-diabetic and they had 28 individuals that were non-diabetic, non-pre-diabetic, so otherwise healthy. This study was a randomized crossover design, meaning that every single person in this study consumed one of the three sugars. So if that is the honey, if that's the sucrose, a regular sugar, as well as the high fructose corn syrup, 55. So how they went about doing that is they had a measure of two weeks where they consumed one sugar, then they had a two to four week washout period to get their body back up to normal levels of wherever it started, and then they consumed the next sugar for two weeks, then a two to four week washout period, and then finally they finished with the final sugar that they had not consumed. Now they did measurements at the baseline, so pre-study, as well as after every single two week uh, interval for each sugar to find out obviously how those sugars impacted the body. In terms of the amount of sugar they consumed, they consumed 50 grams of each sugar every single day on top of their regular nutrition, which was unaltered except for they weren't allowed to consume sugar sweetened beverages. So that was the only stipulation between the various conditions. And in terms of measures, they took blood measures, obviously, to measure blood glucose levels, insulin, a few other health markers, as well as anthropometric measures, making sure that they have particular uh, waist circumference, BMI, their actual weight itself. And they also did a questionnaire based on how they felt and things of that nature. But we're going to be focused on the uh, blood markers specifically. And that's what I have in terms of the methods. So without further ado, let's jump into the ever exciting results. So first I'd like to cover table one, which table one is essentially just covering what the distribution of each sugar is. Because these sugars are disaccharides, meaning that they are primarily made up of two different saccharides or sugars, simple sugars, then you're going to have a different distribution of those two simple sugars. So for example, honey, you'd have a distribution of 36% glucose and 41% fructose, and then the remaining small percentage is other saccharides, but the two that we're focused on are obviously glucose and fructose. Now when it comes to sucrose, I think they mistyped that. I think it's supposed to be 50 and 50 because that's what sucrose is. It's 50% glucose, 50% fructose. And then for high fructose corn syrup 55, the 55 right there denotes exactly the amount of fructose that's found in that particular disaccharide. So 55% fructose with 41% glucose. And I know they've got that switched up, but that is uh, technically the correct definition. They have that written in the legend as well uh, correctly. So uh, the editing by the editors was not exactly stellar for this particular table. Then moving on to table two, this is the baseline measure between the two different uh, types of individuals, pre-diabetic or healthy individuals. 
this essentially just tells us where everybody started out. Now I will say that the way that we're going to be investigating this study is not a comparison between those two groups because you can tell that there are clear massive confounding variables between the two groups. For example, like age, their weight, things of that nature. So it would be completely unfair to compare between those two groups. However, they do need to make sure of one thing, which is that the pre-diabetic individuals are pre-diabetic, which would mean that they'd have elevated fasting blood glucose levels, and that's exactly what we find. That's literally the only thing we're gonna take away from this table. We are not going to be using this table in any way for the interpretation of this study, and we will be looking at the within subjects comparisons, not the between subjects comparisons comparisons, which I will dive into now. This is where things get interested. And just as a reminder, we are only comparing the pre versus the post. So the before the two weeks and after the two weeks, because we can't compare the glucose tolerant to the glucose intolerant because the confounding variables that I mentioned earlier. So one of the first things that we need to look at is what are the differences in weight? Do we see weight gain with any one of these sugars? And the answer is no. We see no changes in weight, which is probably the biggest confounding variable when it comes to nutrition. So it's very important, extremely critical to understand that there are no differences. So whatever differences we see should be largely due, or we can assume are largely due to the sugar's consumption. So then in other markers, what are some of the differences? Well, we see that there's an overall increase in insulin in all three sugar conditions. If that's a comparison of the healthy versus two weeks later healthy, or the insulin insensitive glucose intolerant individuals at baseline and two weeks later, you see an increase in insulin. Now that's not too shocking because they're consuming 50 more grams of sugar in every condition. So of course you're gonna see increases in insulin secretion. That's not exactly revolutionary. As a matter of fact, if it didn't change, I would probably be a little bit more concerned. Now quickly looking at blood pressure, there doesn't seem to be a massive impact of any of these sugars in any condition or especially with healthy individuals on systolic blood pressure. But interestingly, high fructose corn syrup 55 leads to a decrease, a slight, I mean, it's probably gonna make absolutely no real world difference, but a slight decrease in diastolic blood pressure, which is certainly unexpected. The next difference is cholesterol, where we see no increases in cholesterol for the high fructose corn syrup or for the honey conditions, but we do see a slight bump up in healthy individuals with sucrose consumption. So that is quite an interesting finding in its own right. And then the final one that's really a divergent result is that with triglycerides, so serum blood found triglycerides or blood fats, you see increases with the honey condition but you see decreases with the high fructose corn syrup condition. So some, again, pretty unexpected results there as well. For figure two, they're doing an oral glucose tolerance test, again, where individuals are completely fasted, and then they uh, give them a set amount of sugar that they need to consume orally, and then they measure through the bloodstream what happens to that glucose, what happens to that sugar that they consume that's inevitably going to find its way into the bloodstream. Is it cleared out easily? Is it not cleared out easily? But in every situation, you should see at least an initial climb in blood sugar because they just consumed uh, a sizable amount of sugar. So that then they can get some information out of that between different conditions. So what do they find? Well, panels A and B are at baseline compared to two weeks later with all three of these conditions put on one particular plot. And you see that there's absolutely no differences between honey, sucrose, or high fructose corn syrup when it comes to glucose tolerance. So in that regard, in healthy individuals, no impact whatsoever. In C and D panels, 
They're doing the exact same thing, but in pre-diabetic individuals. And again, you see absolutely no differences at baseline and then two weeks later in terms of glucose tolerance. So you don't see an improvement or worsening of that glucose tolerance in normally glucose intolerant individuals. Then figure three is exactly the same thing, but they're not measuring glucose. They're not measuring blood sugar. They're measuring insulin levels. And here again, with A and B, you're looking at healthy individuals at baseline, so pre-study, and then two weeks after each sugar, and you find no differences. Again, that you find that insulin sensitivity is absolutely the same between conditions. And C and D, same thing again, measuring insulin, but in pre-diabetic individuals. And again, you see no differences. I, I notice that the bars are a little bit different there, but statistically speaking, they are absolutely no differences between the three conditions. Okay, so in conclusion, what can we get out of this particular paper? It's relatively simple, but it does give us some information that we can take away from this. Again, we can't compare between the groups because of the massive confounding variables that I mentioned in table one. Of course, glucose intolerant individuals are going to be worse off than glucose tolerant individuals. That's not exactly rocket science, and they didn't need to do this study to find that out. However, we can compare within groups. So before the addition of sugar or any of the particular sugars and two weeks after the addition of those particular sugars. Those two time points, those are the ones that we're really interested in. And then we can compare within the pre-diabetic individuals and within the healthy individuals and see if there are any differences. And what we find is that high fructose corn syrup does not seem to have any negative health outcomes when it comes to triglycerides, when it comes to blood pressure, when it comes to inflammatory markers, when it comes to glucose tolerance, when it comes to insulin sensitivity, none of those are negatively impacted by 50 grams of high fructose corn syrup or 50 grams of sucrose when compared to honey or compared against one another. So, but specifically what I think is most interesting is obviously this high fructose corn syrup 55, that because it is so common, because it is so prevalent, and yet we see no uh, negative impact from the consumption, at least 50 gram consumption. 50 grams, which is a relatively modest amount of consumption of high fructose corn syrup, because keep in mind that would lead you to like little over 25 grams of actual fructose because the rest of that would be glucose or a large amount of that would be glucose. 50 grams seems to show after two weeks, no negative outcomes. So th does that necessarily mean that if you consume 125 grams or 150 grams of high fructose corn syrup 55, that that would not show any negative impact. No, it doesn't. And does that also mean that if you were to consume 50 grams for six months or three years or 10 years, if you wouldn't have some sort of negative outcome from that? No, it doesn't, but it does give us a time point and it gives us an amount. And it's pretty clear that high fructose corn syrup 55 in that amount at that time point does not lead to any negative health outcomes. Okay, so that is what I have for you. Hopefully you found it informative. And with that said, I hope I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Have a good one, guys. See you.